Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, I'm Luisa Giannis, a Chief Operating Officer here at the Aspen Art Museum. I'm Simone Krug, Assistant Curator here at the Aspen Art Museum. And it was such a pleasure to work with Mary during her exhibition here. Um, it was really an experience that I will always cherish, and getting to know her team, her, and so we'll just get started with some questions, and we'll have time for, uh, sorry, for Q&A from the audience at the end. Um, so, Mary, um, let's get started with, uh, we'll have some images here of the exhibition here in Aspen, but can you tell us a little bit about the decisions uh, you made that influence your, the works you chose for the exhibition here, as Nicola alluded to, it being the Neon series, and, um, and why you chose that specific grouping? Um, first of all, I'm going to do the thing where I say, thank you for coming. It's just so great to be here. Um, what a beautiful place, and what an interesting place. And um, I want to say what a wonderful time I've had getting to know um, Nicola Lees, your new director, who is an astounding combination of so many things. You are so lucky to have her. And... The shows here right now are just astounding. And um, what else did I want to make sure to say? So I want to thank Nicola and then Luis Yanis, who has just made my stays so wonderful, going back and forth in front of me on his snowboard to make sure that nobody was going to run into me on opening day at Buttermilk. <laughs> Got some funny stories about that. Yes, and um, Nicole, I mean Simone Krug. Sorry, I backed, I reversed your name. Nicole Simone. It's Simone. Okay. <laughs> and um, thank you so much for working with us, putting the model together, and choosing the paintings. So that gets me to the um, how the paintings were chosen, and uh, one of the good things to begin with was, um, you know, limitations are always good. And so that's, um, yeah, Stephen Prina will attest to that. That's basically how art gets made. He's giving me the, yeah. So pretty much it's how anything gets made, right? Like, you're like, I'm going to write a novel. <laughs> I'm going to write a novel that takes place in one day. You know, that there's a, there's a limitation put on things. So the limitations to this exhibition were the works must reside in Aspen or California. These were the two rules. You're questioning this? Well, we had one in New York. Well, that's because we thought it was in Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it was in Aspen, and then I had, we had done the show, and it had to be in the show, and then we found out later that it was in New York, and so that one got shipped here because it was kind of a key to the show, and you'll see. Um, so that was the, so the limitation was where the work was coming from. So then um, the kind of wonderful thing about this show, I have to say, was that Nicola hadn't arrived at the museum. And so it was just me and Simone. And so we printed out all the paintings. And then we had this sort of, like, plethora of paintings, and then it was just a matter of almost creating another artwork, or not almost creating another work, really creating another artwork. Like, what paintings play well with others? What's the story we're trying to tell? Is there a story we're trying to tell? Are we not trying to tell any story at all? Do they just bounce off of one another in a effective uh, way, like what, ki what kinds of emotions do these combinations elicit? So it was uh, an intuitive process having to do with color and light and sound and space and just feeling. It was really, um, you know, it was supposed to be neon works, which then the great thing is about, about having rules is then breaking the rule, which is important because there's one work that doesn't have neon, which I love that the, the show's called Neon Paintings, and then there's one without neon, so then I get to have the question, but <clears throat> that one doesn't have neon. 
So it's just the, the nice little uh, rule breaker. So that's pretty much how it started out. It was a lot of fun to work on this with you and to yeah. look through all of them and to, yeah. to hear you speak about your impressions looking back at some of these works. Yeah. I think we can move on and speak about um, your experience of doing a mid-career survey which started at the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore and um, has traveled to site Santa Fe. And it's open until, I think, September 5th. So if anyone's doing a road trip, I highly recommend it. It's a great exhibition. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to what was surprising about doing that exhibition, the challenges, and if you would do anything different looking back at that mid-career survey. Um. So just, I just want to say, that's called Nude with Stockings. I just want to kind of finish your show here oh. before, just to get a little baseline. So just so they're flip. What's next slide, please? Oh, this is Peach. This was the special one that got a special trip from New York because I needed that yellow. Like I looked at the show, I was like, ah, I need this yellow spot. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is called Chinese Wedding, and um, I had been staying. Um, there was some, oh, there was construction at my house, and so I went and stayed in uh, uh, up in Pasadena. The old there's a big old hotel up by the Huntington that's like like the Huntington, and there are weddings there, and so I was just sort of living there, and. Um, one weekend there was a Chinese wedding and the outfits were extraordinary. And a woman walked by and she was wearing a dress with purple feathers and glitter. And I was like, this is fantastic. I'm gonna make a painting of this dress. So you see this has the feathers and the, so this is, this is a, a, pa a painting of that woman's dress. Next. Um, this is called The Sea, The Sea. And um, this is my painting. And um, it never, it never, it's just is what it is. So it has its own light. Next, and we put this in the, in the show. Next painting. And uh, this has a very long title. This has a very long title, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's theatrical, and I have always thought that this was the scene in Hamlet where uh, uh, there's Polonius, somebody knows Polonius is behind the curtain and he gets stabbed by accident. It's all a big problem. So you see one, two, three characters and the ghosty one. You know, in Hamlet, it's this, you know, <laughs> race to the bottom where everyone dies. And I'm all, I've always been very interested in the works, which is going to seg into... Um, the, you're nodding your head already, seg into the Santa Fe show because the themes of um, myth, uh, opera, um, classic theater have run throughout. And so sometimes the theme comes before the painting, sometimes the theme comes after. So I made this and I thought, this is definitely Shakespeare. I always thought. So it has a title that says something like, Enter King Claudius. And then it's a list of like every single person in the play. <laughs> so it's a stage direction from Hamlet. And uh, next slide. Okay, so this is Site Santa Fe. And um, the show's up till? September 5th. September 5th. And what was the question? Something like, what would I have done differently? Challenges, experience. Maybe what you have, would have done differently. Yeah. Well, so the biggest challenge to this show is that um, although my work has um, maintained uh, a kind of thematic consistency over the years, the earliest painting in the show is 1989, it's, it's retained a thematic consistency and color consistency and it's all made by me and the way that the works are made 
has shifted over time. I think that's the best explanation for um, the uh, obvious thing that w the work looks very different in 1989 till now. And um, so the challenge was to uh, create a, an exhibition that lays, uh, that kind of leads you through ha the ideas and then creates a kind of a structure that will get hopefully a bit of an aha in terms of uh, th threading the works together. I think that was it. And what would I have done differently? Um, <laughs> mm, nothing. <laughs> that's it. That's a great answer. I love that. Um, kind of skipping around back to our show, yeah. thinking back to your trip when you were here last December um, to install the show. Talk a little bit about what your relationship is to nature. And obviously when you were here, you decided to extend your trip. And if there's a spiritual element to your connection with nature, that's then in, in your work. Um, thanks, Louise. Um, were we talking about skiing yesterday? We were talking about skiing. We were also talking about the ocean a little bit. Yeah. I, I think I was saying that, like, I, I don't like, it's not like I've always wanted to ski for the, like, learn how to be a skier. It's just that I like being on top of a mountain of, like, in the snow with the trees, and it's so quiet up there. And, uh, um... And also, like, going on a horse into places that I can't really hike to. And uh, so my relationship to nature, I was thinking about it. You know, um, I was born in Ojai, and um, I don't mean to be too, I don't really people start talking about their childhood, it gets like very boring right away. But, uh, uh, so, magical memories of walking through orange groves. Like, sp sparkling sun, oranges, lettuces, the machine that comes and waters the dust, the dirt road when the it gets too dry, and so there's a, a big watering thing that drives along and waters the dirt road. And um, my parents uh, were friends with one of their good friends, and they sort of had a limited circle of good friends, and they were the eccentric people in town. And, uh, and in Ojai, in the 60s, um, there were eccentric people because they had moved there uh, because they were theosophists and followers of Krishnamurti. Now, anyone that knows art history, that should set off some ding, ding, ding bells because so many, so much of um, 20th century abstraction, you know, can, really uh, can be credited to almost thinking about Krishnamurti. I mean, uh, Mondrian was a card-carrying theosophist, which is always a surprise, but then it explains those strange paintings he did of the sort of radiant heads. And now, right now, there's it's the ending of the um, Agnes Pelton show in Palm Springs. I'm trying to stay on point here. So they were friends with a man named Franklin Fireshaker. Franklin Fireshaker was Ponca. And he, I remember very clearly, he painted these swirling paintings that gets to the spirituality. And so he, he uh, I, I don't know, I have to ask if they were uh, 
peyote induced or not, but he was, but in a way that it's like a true, the true, you know, he for many years was the leader of the powwows in Southern California and like traditional leaders. And so his name was Franklin Fireshaker. He lived in Ohio. He was one of my parents' best friends. Long was his wife, all of their children. And uh, I would, that was my first experience of art. And it was like very connected to Ojai. And, um, and uh, I loved Franklin Fireshaker. And they had another friend who was a sculptor. So the sort of art got connected, I think, to the dirt, to the earth, to like what was there in, in Ojai. And um, moved to Los Angeles, saw the art and technology show in 71. So I was like born in 63, 71, I'm like eight years old. Great, like mind-blowing experience for an eight-year-old. And so, and even at eight years old, like this is the sort of spiritual as spiritual thing about it. Like, no parents go in the like the van, and then you get out, and great pools of algae, which I later learned in college was a. Um, I'm having the brain freeze. Gordon Matta Clark uh, installation. So my little heart sang uh, looking at this work and uh, a big room full of cardboard boxes. That was Robert Morris. And this was back when, I mean, this is like one of the most, <laughs> one of the most important exhibitions of the last 50 years. And somebody, uh, the curator, Maurice Tuckman, uh, like Prina's just going to nod when I get it right. Okay, so Maurice Tuckman paired corporations with artists. So um, these big projects. So they were so I had, had the experience of that of art trying to make this kind of simple. So uh, I have always said I, I don't I, I don't think I paint landscape paintings per se, but they're paintings of experience experiences, like trying to paint uh, the very experience, like um, what is it, Madame Bovary is like uh, essentially trying to evoke the color yellow. Like what if you have a goal like that? You know, it's sort of like I imagine playing golf, like there's that hole really far away and I'm gonna, it's gonna go from here to there. There's a kind of impossible imaging that has to go on in one's mind, right? So with this painting, The Sea, The Sea, I knew I was going to paint the experience of being in the sea. Um, not a sign of it, but the experience of being tumbled about. So it's almost like, okay, get this image in my head and then shoot for it. And then hopefully it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I think is it that, worked in this okay, case. Okay, let's move to the next question. <laughs> it totally worked in this case. I'm just going to ramble on forever. I'm going to okay. I'm going to ask if you can speak to change the subject. Um, if you can speak about risk taking in your work and how you find ways to move outside of your comfort zone. Okay. Well, every time I paint, it's completely outside my comfort zone. 100. percent It's terrible. It's awful. <laughs> it's uh, so. I think I'm so scared. I think I have such a, um, uh, I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid of things. I'm afraid of the, what's gonna happen next. Uh, uh, you could call that a lack of faith or whatever you wanna call it, I don't know. But, uh, and so I've set the situation up in my studio to be a, um, a kind of sudden death situation. So uh, what it does is it reproduces um, uh, the challenge of living for me. So I paint on the floor, it's a blank canvas, it's been prepared, it's taken a really long time, 
I've uh, had the linen wo woven in Belgium. I even built a loom that's sitting in Belgium. I pay rent on it, and uh, it's really big. It's Mercedes Benz. I asked the guy, I went to Belgium, I went to this mill. I said, like, so, he's like, he says, oh, yeah, there are two kinds of mills. There's a Fiat and Mercedes Benz. I go, well, what's the difference? He goes, well, Fiat goes faster, Mercedes lasts longer. I go, okay, okay. So anyway, I have a Mercedes-Benz loom, and it's sitting over in Belgium, and it weaves the linen for me, uh, of course, for me. And uh, the reason I had to build a loom was because of that damn credit default swap crisis that made all these little places close in 2008. And so the linen mill that used to make this fabulous linen that was very bumpy went out of business. So I had to go to Belgium and search around. That's a longer story, but quite interesting. That's, that's a whole other adventure back to the fearful stuff. So that was really, I, I, I found out that the linen mill had closed. I was at a party at Laura Owens's and she told me the linen mill closed, there was no more linen. And I went in the kitchen and cried. And I felt, it felt so utterly unreasonable to cry. But I, I think it was just a moment where I, I couldn't, uh, I was a little bit, Delicate, and uh, so then, okay, because this is it make it's everything with the paintings is the linen, and um, <clears throat> so I've worked really hard on this blank canvas. The linen's coming from it's like a lot invested there, and so then I can I have all my paint all mixed up. I have all the water. I have all the sponges. I have all the brushes. I have everything. Supposedly, I've had a good night's sleep. Supposedly, my neck doesn't hurt. Supposedly, everything's okay. Supposedly, I haven't taken a terrible phone call. And so then I go, oh, I have to, uh, I have to start, I have to start. And then what if I make the wrong move? What if I make the wrong move? What if I make the wrong opening move? But Mary, you've done the opening move before. There's a kind of conversation that happens and where I kind of talk myself into the risk of the opening move. Then once the opening move's been made, and I go, okay. You go, well, that's a pretty great opening move, or that was a terrible opening move. You should have been paying more attention. How could you not be paying more attention? Sort of like when you bowl, you know, and you're like, I'm going to de definitely bowl over all these pins. You like, and it just goes in the gutter, and you go, how did that happen? Like, I had this image. I was going to knock over the pins, and then it just went in the gutter. This is how the painting is. Uh, that's that's great 100 to hear about your process. <laughs> your inner monologue. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Mary, you know, following up on that, I feel really honored to look at the um, pictures you showed me on your phone, talking about process and, and seeing that uh, through your practice. When do you consider a painting to be a good painting? Ah. <laughs> Sometimes it's a good painting and then I mess it up. Oh, no. <laughs> And then I look at my phone, I, I look at it, I was showing you something the other day, going, I should have stopped here. <laughs> I should have stopped here. But if we can look at the sea, the sea, can you guys find that one? Here's an interesting thing. A painting cannot be too interesting all over. This is very important. And you'll see this with great paintings. You'll see this with... Uh, you know, stuff that I look like, look at, like Rembrandt, Matisse, or, no, Matisse sometimes makes it interesting everywhere. And, you know, of course, Pollock is the same all over. How did he do it? I don't know. But here's the situation. This painting was interesting all over. And so it had no resting spot. And I always have to build in a resting spot uh, in the paintings, and so I took a big bucket of, not a big bucket of water, a medium bucket of water, big bucket of water, it could have been a bad thing, but do you see this kind of flume in the 
center. I just took the water and I, whoosh, and that was the end of the, that, I knew it was done. Because then I go, okay, we have the blurry resting place. There's, so there's a kind of like, there's detail and then there's a mushy place and I have a, a yeah, that's when it's, it's like done. a calm part of the sea. It's like a yeah, like a calm part, and that and it happens a lot in my paintings. The the resting place. Yeah, I mean, I can, we can look at other ones. I can tell you where I where I mushed it up a bit. Which ones? I don't know. Just pick one. Okay, wait. Go back to my Hamlet one. See the the uh, silver figure in the back is so you have almost this uh, feeling of. Uh, you know, is that Polonius behind the curtain? Like, there's something, some energy that's further behind these characters that are definitely having a strong conversation. You know, there are these two characters that are speaking strongly. This one is, uh, that one's shadowy in the back. So that was the, the pushing the silver figure back. That's it. I have to go back and look at Blue Cut Fire. I feel like that's one where I didn't find a resting place. Blue, no resting place? There's so much color in that work. Yes. And it's one of my the favorites. The color. And, and we're not even speaking about the neon, so we might as well, you know, give it a go. Give it a whirl. <laughs> uh, creates a blind spot almost. So there, and then there's another blank spot. And it's almost, it's like a reversed Fontana. Fontana. You know, there's a cut that, you know, Fontana's work, I was going to say without exception, it's about the void, this is not true. Because of the ceramic works, but later on, the sort of voidy pods that he made. Um, but, uh, so, uh, Hopefully at Site Santa Fe, the show makes the case that the neon comes out of collage. Like I was uh, at a certain point trying to uh, just um, mess with the surface. And um, so, is this okay I talk about this now? <laughs> I was, uh, I was, uh, I mean, I've told this story before, but I might as well. I, uh, I got a job at Cal State Bakersfield, and it was a five-week assignment to work with the students to create an exhibition that we would do from start to finish. And so I was up in Bakersfield driving around wondering, how am I going to involve the students in this work? And how will I make paintings for Bakersfield? And I'd had this thought before. I don't know if you've had this experience where the sun's going down and you pull up to a stoplight. I think you probably have. And you think, that's gorgeous. Like there's the sunset and then there's the green light or the red light. And uh, who doesn't like the lights of the city going on when the sky is changing color? And... Uh, Bakersfield has a lot of uh, leftover neon signs that they've never torn down, unlike Los Angeles. And uh, I just thought, well, like the seashell paintings or the sponge paintings, I'll just, I'll just add the neon into the painting and then, and then that will be paintings of the experience of driving around Bakersfield where the, the signs are passing in your peripheral vision. Um, I don't know what the original question was. <laughs> well, we said we weren't going to go there. For the neon, oh, but <laughs> right. So, but, the, but the neon creates a kind of not, it's almost like the anti-rusting place. Like it's a cut in the vision. And throughout the, it, it, in, Site Santa Fe, there's a, a theme of, uh, of blindness that runs through, of like not being able to see. There's a painting that, I don't know if we have a picture of it, but it was a, a silkscreen painting I made of a nest of eels, and there's one eel that has a, a 
the sort of main character eel has a white eye, and um, so I've always thought of that that eel as Oedipus. And I made a painting once called Three Roads, which is where, you know, Oedipus is always worried he's going to kill his father. Uh, but he does, you know, he meets him where three roads meet and kills him after spending his entire life trying not to kill his father. Uh, next question. <laughs> um, this painting is called Western Mystery. And it's the um, it's actually uh, Point Doom in um, Malibu, which is a sacred site. And um, this was my f when I first started drawing for Nate from nature. I was I was uh, I went to somebody's sort of birthday picnic in Malibu, and I took my sketch pad and I thought this is this is so there this point and so iconic. I drew, drew it, and then I went back many times and drew it over and over again, and then I made many paintings of this uh, promontory um, that filled up the visual field. So then that, that's the sort of hmm, uh, theme of uh, one's vision being blocked. Going back again and again to the same site to paint or draw the same landscape takes on a ritualistic nature. And I wondered if you can speak about ritual in your work, how that plays into it. Mm hmm. Hmm. I hate to say that it doesn't. The place that I went back to the most, that after the rock, I always had the problem of, I had a figure ground problem that everybody who's, you know, trying to paint from life does, but then I found a sea cave in Pismo Beach, and when I saw it, I thought, ah, aha, my figure ground problem is solved, and I'll paint the nothingness. And also, there was a great art historical, um, uh, reference to that of Courbet's paintings of the source of the Lou, which are these great paintings of the source of the Lou, giant cave with the water uh, running out. And uh, so I um, painted the sea cave on the north end of Pismo Beach uh, for a long time, maybe four years. So I go there and make drawings on site, much like there's the great um, Swiss symbolist for uh, Hodler, and he made many, many drawings of Lake Geneva on site and would go back to the studio and make the paintings of, from the drawings. So I have to say, it, I felt like it was less ritualistic than more um, almost scientific because what happened at the sea cave in Pismo that was the real shocker was that all the sand washed out. And I had been painting this cave with a smooth sand bottom sitting on the sand. And then I went up there one year and the sand was gone and it was rocky and the bottom of the cave was rocky. And um, so I painted the cave so many times. Oh, there's a painting of the cave. That's one of the beginning ones that before it got simplified, and um, it's called Georgia because it reminded me of Georgia. O'Keeffe painting, and I knew someone named Georgia that died. And um, so it got simplified over it. By the time I finished working with that, it, it became a, a, this sort of triangle within a, almost like a triangle within a, a squished circle. So I'd say more scientific excursion than um, ritualistic. How about that? I like it. I think we're going to open it up for questions right now. Here. Hi. I, um, I love that you brought the theosophist into the discussion because also Puma Auckland was um, you know, an early 20th century female artist very inspired by that painting. So in light of that, and because there's so much light in your paintings, one of the things I love is the absence of light. And 
replacement of the, of the neon red that's not that that's lacking light. Is there um, symbolism to the absence of light with those um, with the parts before it gets light um, in the neon? You mean the cords? Oh, the chords, okay. The chords are um, definitely the third part of the painting. I always think of it's the painting, the light, and the chords. And the chords are another way of just sort of um, scribbling on the painting. Like I think of um, Picabia a lot. Like those Picabia paintings that have the sort of overdrawing kind of confluence of drawing and painting. So the chords are really, uh, okay, scratch the word really. The chords are important. Um, and I love uh, wiring the painting because even if I can figure out where the lights go, then there's this other part that's the chords and I have three choices, black, white, or gray. And I had the chords manufactured for myself in Italy when those stopped being made. <laughs> it's like everything I use keeps like going out of business. So, but not to worry. I had, I had a lot made. Hi, Larry. Um, so, uh, let's see, in uh, 1990, 1990, I made, I started making stain paintings that had a silk screened element in them. It was as if it was Many years ago, I worked at the Princeton Drawings Department for my work-study job at Princeton University. And one of the collections they have is a collection of Helen Frankenthaler lithographs. And I was with my boss, and we were putting them in the frames to make this little show. And I kept looking at these thinking, there should be something else here. I don't, where is the, like, it was almost like those Frankenthaler lithographs are all resting place and no punctum. And I was like, if I could only make these and just put some focus in it, like um, Roland Barthes, uh, there's a Roland Barthes book called Camera Lucida, and he talks about the punctum of a, of a photograph. Like, what is it? What's the, the, the thing? And... Um, so it was almost like a translation of that book. So I made these stained paintings that had a silk screen in them. Like, see the, that's not quite accurate because that was after the, uh, the there's a, a painting in the show based on the opera Turon Dot that's a black stain with a chrysanthemum in it. And if, if you guys can find that. But um, so, the stain was interrupted by the silk, there it is, that's called third riddle. So the stain was interrupted by this kunk, kunk, you know. So it was like, do you remember when stained glass went, sliding stained glass doors became popular and then people were walking through them? So, because they didn't, no, so you had to put a sticker on it, don't walk through, it's gonna break. This is before the shatterproof glass. So I always thought of these paintings as like the sticker on the sliding glass door. And uh, so you can see how that carries through to creating, to the neon going on the work where it's almost like an even more like the sticker on the sliding glass door is here, but the neon is like here, sort of. I mean, it's sort of like, I like looking at the paintings because I don't know what to look at. And my eye keeps being drawn back to the neon like a moth to the flame. Like, I'm looking, I, no, no, I want to look at the painting. Oh, I have to look at this, I got to look at the painting. So does that, does that kind of, Later on, I was gluing seashells and starfish. I made big star skies out of starfish that 
there's a lot of reversals, sort of like uh, surrealist reversals in terms of, I mean, this really gets into Frida Kahlo and a kind of, and maybe even to your, speaks to your question of spirituality where there's some great Frida Kahlo paintings where her body is turning into uh, the earth itself and the happenings of the earth itself and there's all kinds of activity sh activities going on. And so um, this, uh, this could be uh, a shrouded figure or a head or a butte or a cave. You know, is it a, is it a grieving figure? You know, and, and so that flipping is part of what I'm working on all the way through. And I don't have enough time to pick it out and show you this is flip, flip, flip. But say the star skies, there's these, there are these great field paintings that are made with gluing starfish in the sky. And that original uh, inspiration comes from a film by the great uh, American uh, surrealist Man Ray, where he runs down to the sea with the camera, and the camera rolls, it's a black and white film, very early, rolls upside down, so the ocean is rolling over the viewer's head. And so I made a lot of paintings, the first one being called The Ocean is in the Sky, where the ocean and the uh, sky are reversed. And the first I, I think where I read about it was in an um, Irish folktale. Okay, how about that? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Nancy? Thank you so much for discussing your process, especially your relationship and experience, plus your interest in art historical references. When you're making your first gesture, how many of these items are present in your mind to start with? Do you discover them yet? Um. Well. Mostly, say, I, was on, I went on this hike past Mar Maroon Bells to Crater Lake, and there was a section where the rocks are coming down, you know. And uh, there is that, that, did I just, oh, Maroon Bells, I, I already have the, the word Ice House Canyon in my head. There's a hike in Los Angeles called Ice House Canyon, and there are these white rocks that come tumbling down, and I did, I got, went to the studio, I thought, okay, I need to my, make this Ice House Canyon paintings, and they've gotta be white with deep shadow, so they were white, black, and gray. I mean, it's, More recently, I have, eh, I always have like a, a, some kind of starting point. Like recently I've been trying to make rainbows. How about that for risk? <laughs> That's terrible. It's awful. <laughs> Stephen, did you raise your hand? Oh no, it's just that um, uh, the, uh, the question about like how did you, why did you start putting neon in, then I think I've told it so many times that then I just didn't want it, didn't want it to become like it had just worn a groove and I'm telling the same story in the same way over and over. Did you realize that the, the series that um, succeeds rainbows is chitinous. <laughs> 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 but, but I didn't want, want to make a comment or ask a question about the neon. It's not about the obvious, you know, clips by introduced drawing and painting. Um, but, and it's very present in installation views here from, from this museum that you see the neon reflected in the floor, it glows. Yeah. And then the 
the painting itself is absorbed. So the painting radiate, I mean the neon radiates, it emits light. And then the painting surface itself is absorbed in the mechanism is in heightened in the reflection of their polished pores. You know, you're kind of talking about it as a cut and uh, I thought it was very uh, informative the story about Baker's field. Like how do you capture two phenomena um, simultaneously and then incorporate that into one thing? I just thought maybe you could talk about how the neon and the painting address the stuff together. Okay. Sure. So um, the paint is uh, I work with this paint. It's it's called flash. So it's very matte. And this is really like <laughs> key to the whole thing because originally when I started using flash paint, I wanted to um, shake off the gravitas of oil paint and uh, I was living in New York, and uh, sometimes you'd walk into an exhibition and it would just smell like oil paint. I love that smell. But I thought, I need to push the work into some place that's not as sort of um, uh, seriously considered. But also, I didn't want any reflection. I wanted the painting to be a kind of absorbing, or not kind of, I wanted the painting to absorb light completely, sort of like a, um, but then also it would be like a, a child's drawing, like uh, your kid goes to school, they make the painting with the temper paint, you put it on the uh, refrigerator. So I wanted it to have that, oh, it's, 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 it's not serious, but how to take a, the sort of that kind of paint and then try to kind of eke out a, an emotional timber. Uh, and so the surface is, is absorbing light. Then the neon that's just screwed onto the painting, which of course art historically references or kind of just comes out of like, you know, how is this a possibility? Mar well, you know, I'd see Mario Mertz and other, you know, Arte Pover thing. I did a lot of research on where neon came from, where it was invented, all that later. Um, so, the, you know, the first ones I made, they were just such an odd experience, odd visual experience that was almost, I mean, I've never said this before, but it was almost cinematic. Like, how do I represent, in the case of Bakersfield, the experience of driving around at dusk? And curiously enough, I've never said this before, but that was, you know, the Picasso Brock project of, of, <laughs> of how, does how does the painter represent time passing? Like I'm sitting at a cafe having, you know, having a coffee and time is passing and the great, great cubist paintings are really about the passage of time and it's like invented in 1905 and and Einstein comes up with the theory of relativity equals mc squared right around that time and I once, many, many years ago, I attended a lot of, uh, astrophysics lectures at the Hayden Planetarium. I became, I was completely, I was always there, always there. There was a very small audience, maybe this size, and they were curated by um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he would bring in the premier astrophysicists from wherever, and, uh, and that is in the work, all that stuff, so I, uh, this was before he became a celebrity. I said, you know, I need to have lunch with you and ask you a question. Okay, fine. So we had lunch at, up at the Natural History Museum, and I said, um, do you think Einstein's relativity has anything to do with cubism? And he said, no. 
that was, that was his answer. He said, anybody that finds these, these are just coincidences. But I kind of think it was in the air. So, so I'm thinking about that, like cubism, like how do I make a painting of having a coffee with my friend and reading the paper and the people going by and the sounds and the this and the that. And that's like, you know, the great era of cubism. So how do I make a painting of even the sort of free feeling of the sky and the urban environment and the kind of, uh, the sublime nature of the urban environment, like the ones that are, um, this one's called um, uh, Ruby, uh, Ruby One, Thrifty Mart. So it was a night painting, and that light is actually the old tea from the Thrifty Mart. It was a big tea in Bakersfield. And what I was thinking, which I suppose is, you know, I just thought, and we're even looking at it right now. Think about everything that that neon sign is seeing. Like what goes on in the parking lot of Thrifty Mart in Bakersfield. Like everything, everything. Like falling in love, like making love, falling in love, doing drugs, everything wrong, murders, this, that. That sign is seeing everything. And in a way it's like, the rock, in a way it's like uh, the point doom that's kind of seen everything. So it's like those great, it's, it is cinematic. Like it's a, there's almost some kind of a story where we can kind of imagine. I mean, this is, it's like, I mean, it's a terrible thing to admit to trying to paint something that's as large as the human condition, but that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> that's brave. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, wait, I gotta get a good answer here. <laughs> this is the last question. You guessed it, Amnon. Um, no, no, I don't. I, I, I could say something funny because I'm nervous, but I'm not going to. Um, no, no, it's like a, I want to get this right. Like, I don't know if I could think it up, but there's a, a painting hanging at the end, the Anderson collection called Black Painting. And there is a, um, I mean, Okay, some of my favorite paintings are those Hammond's uh, paintings with the garbage bag on them. Like, that's definitely like a, I mean, but that would be like very, you know, honoring. I, the, anyway, it, sometimes I see my paintings, it, there's a early Francis with the, the moving lozenges. And then there's my painting is there a um, is there a Gottlieb? Like it's like around the corner is like Pollock's Lucifer, and I'm kind of glad it's not next to it. But just being within the vicinity is pretty nice. But then, you know, on the other hand, you know, if I could be in a show with Eva Hess, that would, I mean, because her work is we I haven't talked about her, but of course. The chords, like there's a lot of Hess because I was, you know, wanted to, I was copying Eva Hess's paintings when I was in college, like just remaking a lot of those. I mean, there's so, there's so many, there's so many things that you could uh, put. 
put in relation to that. That's a great You're answer. Welcome. Thank you for Thank being you, here. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. And we'll end it on that note. Uh, also, thank you, Stephen, for his question. Please stick around for his performance at oh, yes. 2 o'clock? This afternoon. This afternoon.